So thanks for joining us today. We have an hour together. We have five speakers joining us, um, most from from Canada, but one one joining us all the way from London, England. So hopefully that's not a, a technical challenge. Um, subject matter is co-op development findings from a, a national study, and it's going to explore the factors for successful cooperative development and does government policy make a difference. My name is Brendan Denovan. I'm the Communications Manager at Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada. And I would like to take a moment to explain the Measuring the Cooperative Dif Difference Research Network, uh, who is hosting today's webinar. Uh, they're also the source of this whole series that began in 2010. Uh, the Research Network is a pan-Canadian network of researchers, students, co-op practitioners. There's four research cl clusters across Canada who organize the various projects locally. The network is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, which provided funding in, back in 2010 for this project, and it'll run until 2015. The network is engaged in research that explores an in, the impacts of cooperatives in their communities, be they social, economic, or environmental. The speakers today include Dr. Fiona Duguid. She's a research, research, researcher and consultant. She has uh, led research in several national and international cooperative and social economy projects. Fiona worked with the Canadian Cooperative Association as a researcher and as a senior policy ana analyst with Rural and Cooperative Secretariat with Agriculture Canada. Dr. Marcello Vieta is a, an assistant professor in the program uh, in adult education and community development with Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. Marcello uh, was also a research fellow with the European Research Institute on Cooperative and Social Enterprise Yerxes in Trento, Italy. Prior to that role, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Social Economy Centre within the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. Uh, we also have uh, three participants in this study who, who offered information and background. Uh, Dan Oler uh, worked with a small dedicated group of, of leaders to incorporate the Sangudo Opportunity Development Co-op in 2010. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Dan's involvement as co-founder and board chair allow him to work on a contract with the Alberta Cooperative, Community and Cooperative Association to develop the Unleashing Local Capital Program and to support community, community leaders across Alberta to apply that model. Seth Leon is the research officer for Alberta Community and Cooperative Association. Since 2012, he has worked with the Unleashing Local Capital Project. Seth has also worked with BC Alberta Social Economy Research Alliance to examine the diffusion of social finance. And finally, we have Joel Stoddart, who is the Business Development Manager at CareForce Health Services in Nova Scotia. He has been a member of the co-op, uh, worker co-op since 2013, and he has, uh, has worked with CareForce since 2012. Joel also worked as a small business development counselor at Acadia University where he helped entrepreneurs start and grow their businesses. So these are our panelists today and we have a PowerPoint deck that we will flow through. Uh, I'm going to hand over the reins to Fiona <coughs> Duguid to make her, make her presentation. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, hello, it's Fiona here. Um, this is uh, our a project that Marcel and I have been working on for some time called Collective Entrepreneurship in Canada's New Cooperatives. Um, and as you can see on the uh, PowerPoint, um, which uh, Brendan's just starting up now, um, our first slide is around the research focus of this particular uh, project. Uh, so this is looking at why groups use the co-op model and so, as opposed to investor-owned or private sector or nonprofit organizations models. Um, to meet their social or cultural or environmental or economic needs of their members or their community. Um, here are some of the research questions that Marcelo and I were exploring um, and our uh, panelists here today were uh, very helpful with us um, at answering some of these uh, questions. So the first question is really about um, uh, how have Canadian cooperatives sought to meet their members or, co-op or their communities social, cultural, economic or environmental needs through using the co-op model. So uh, sort of a basic for a starter off question when we're thinking about new co-op development. 
what advantages does the co-op model faci you, um, facilitate for meeting members' needs again? And then what are challenges do members um, encounter when they are starting up or further developing their co-op need, their the co-op initiative? And then why are these co-ops um, succeeding? Um, and fail is probably a bit strong, but um, or uh, working to overcome some of these challenges. And then what innovations have new or expanding co-ops forged in order to offer both members and the surrounding communities new or better ways um, for satisfying their needs. So those are some of the research questions that Marcel and I looked at um, in this research project. And how we looked at this project, um, as we flip to the next uh, slide, um, was through a grounded theory approach. Um, grounded theory is very much, a, um, we are interested in the lived experiences of the founders and the folks that we have here on our panel today are, are very much those people, the, the founders and, and uh, working through the experiences of developing a new co-op. And grounded theory helps us to do that because uh, you come in with um, not uh, a whole set of uh, uh, ideologies and beliefs that you're framing your research. Instead, you're letting the research emerge from the experiences of the, of, of the people that you're speaking with and, and talking to. Uh, how we did this, we had a survey. Um, in the end, our survey was uh, about 66 different co-ops answered our survey. Not too bad, not super great, um, but not too bad in terms of a survey. Um, interviews, uh, we have fabulous interviews with um, 27 uh, key respondents. So these are 27 people from different co-ops across Canada. And then we also did um, the two focus groups, uh, so two times two. So we did two focus groups with two different groups within those focus groups, so up to uh, 50 participants. And we were able to do this at the CDI, at the final um, Cooperative De Development Initiative Conference. Um, which was a fabulous experience for, for us, and um, we certainly learned a lot in, in that in doing that. So to move to the next slide, um, this is uh, what our survey told us, and it's actually really very representative of uh, what the rest of Canada looks like in terms of the types of co-ops, uh, non-financial co-ops um, in Canada. For example, consumer co-ops sitting at about 20%, multi-stakeholder um, sitting at about 25%, that is a, a higher number because, of course, in Quebec there are a number of multi-stakeholder uh, worker co-ops sitting at about 10, producer sitting at um, about uh, 15, and new generation, we have a small percentage of those in here in Canada, and at 2%, and then housing, um, for us it was actually a little bit smaller than what the rest of Canada is at 1%, and then federation sitting at 6%. So I understand that you can now see the slide. So as we move to the next slide, this is just a list of some of the ty of the um, industries or sectors that the co-ops that we interviewed and were and talked to. So you can see a long list of new and emerging uh, sectors for co-ops. Everything from renewable energy, communications, the community opportunity co-ops, of which we have uh, some folks here today um, with Dan and Seth, uh, who can speak to that. Um, people with working with uh, co-ops working with people with disabilities, health and home care, which we'll see um, from Joel with Careforce, organic foods, a very uh, emerge, a large and emerging uh, sector for new co-ops in Canada. Car sharing, farmers co-ops, worker co-ops, business conversions. We'll talk a little bit about that. Education-based co-ops, and then um, the funeral co-op. Again, uh, huge, quite a big popular model in in Quebec. Not as popular across Canada, but um, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes for the future. Um, so now I'm going to turn uh, the uh, the presentation and the slides over to Marcelo. Sure, thanks, Fiona. <clears throat> so, out of our um, grounded theory approach, we discovered that <clears throat> excuse me, we discovered that um, uh, cooperative development in Canada today is rich with uh, what's called in the literature social or collective entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, David Connell, who was one of the first to describe this clearly, uh, and also relating it to cooperatives, describes collective entrepreneurship as combining business risk and capital investment with the social values of collective action. Um, it exists when collective action aims for the economic and social betterment of a locality, 
um, and for the production of, of goods and services and needs by an enterprise. So it's the combination of, as in any entrepreneurial activity, risk taking, there is risk involved obviously, actions, uh, social actions mostly, and resource pooling and activities coming together and pooling resources, um, but in particular rooted in socially driven values and objectives, and that's what defines um, collective entrepreneurship. Cooperatives, the literature suggests, and Fiona and I agree, <laughs> um, are, are perhaps the clearest example of collective entrepreneurship. Um, so next slide. So collective entrepreneurship is also, uh, the literature suggests and, and our uh, research has shown in Canada, is connected somehow to social movements, so broader uh, movements to uh, provide provision for the, uh, for the needs of, uh, of communities driven by uh, social collectivities. Um, so it's embedded in broader networks, initiatives, ideals, um, and uh, in fact social movements are in civil society are closely linked uh, to social entrepreneurial activity. That is, the, the activity that happens in social movements is also, in a sense, uh, uh, examples of social entrepreneurialism. Um, so co-ops also, uh, in, in the historical literature, are, are one type of uh, business that has long been understood uh, as emerging or responding to the collective actions and demands uh, for social change. So uh, these two uh, traditions in uh, sociological theory, so to speak, which is, uh, uh, and, and organizational theory, cooperatives on the one hand and social movements on the other hand, when they're described, they actually have this collective entrepreneurship uh, uh, present in them. So uh, recent literature has been combining um, those two the similarities between social movements and, and collective entrepreneurship and discovering that um, uh, that they're both uh, intertwined, so to speak. <clears throat> so in, in the cases that we looked at in Canada, uh, they were also um, tended to fall into these three types of collective entrepreneurialism, or the entrepreneurs tend to fall within, within these three categories, which are first we can look at insider collective entrepreneurialism. And this is collective entrepreneurialism that emerges from people within social movements already. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the second one is outsider collective entrepreneurialism that a social movement inspires um, uh, a, a collective enterprise to emerge. Uh, and then thirdly, the social entrepreneurialism, or collective entre entrepreneurial activities themselves inspire social movements. And one example of this is the microfinance movement. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so here are, so these next two slides are, are graphs showing, uh, kind of evidencing this, this cooperative, uh, this collective entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship in our, um, in our sample. Um, so first, if you look at the economic sectors, so where, where are they doing their business? Uh, pretty much in Canada, we see uh, this a strong social objective to cooperatives. Uh, it's not a mystery to those that start cooperatives, um, but it, it is uh, it is worth mentioning uh, to those that are interested in more broader um, types of uh, organizations, so to speak, and, and what distinguishes really cooperatives from other types of businesses. Um, but what we see in Canada also and throughout these economic sectors is that uh, the cooperatives in Canada, you can form a cooperative just to meet the mutual needs of members. But in general, new cooperatives emerging in Canada today, uh, first of all, looking at their economic sectors, have strong collective entrepreneurial uh, um, motivation, so to speak. So we see that 14%, uh, for example, uh, of our sample uh, were in the health sector, and, and and many of those coming from Quebec, where the cooperative model has been used for healthcare uh, healthcare delivery for some time. Uh, and towards the end of the graph, you can see social services is also quite strong. And also at the very end of the graph, utilities, um, why uh, alternative power utilities are being formed. Um, has something to, do, something to do with price, of course, so that is something that's of interest to the members of the co-op, but also uh, more greener energy, uh, which is, has a strong social objective as well. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And these are the main motivators. Now, when we asked what motivated you to start your cooperative, here we see a clear 
collective entrepreneurial endeavor, that is, this outward social objective and social mission. Um, and we see some differences in Quebec and the rest of Canada. In our survey, um, well, when we analyzed our data, we, we did see differences between how Quebec's develop and emerge in, in, in sorry, how cooperatives develop and emerge in Quebec and, uh, and in the rest of Canada. So one that stands out is alternative health care. Again, uh, Quebec has had a long tradition uh, in using the cooperative model and the multi-stakeholder cooperative model in particular around alternative health care. So that's, that's one, uh, and that was one driving motivator for, for many uh, in, our, in our Quebec sample. But also community arts and recreation, that that was what motivated community economic development against a strong in Quebec because of their um, uh, support that they receive from, from CDRs or from local uh, cooperative uh, development initiatives in Quebec. Um, and in the last two uh, of the last three, uh, employment for marginalized communities uh, was, uh, was present also, and social care and social services delivery. Uh, when we look at uh, the, all of Canada, this tends to be the strongest motivator uh, for, for developing new cooperatives. So here we see a strong across the board um, uh, collective entrepreneurship happen. Uh, and lastly, before we uh, open it up to our um, uh, to our questions, to our, to the rest of our panelists, um, Fiona and I have thought about this and have categorized this collective entrepreneurial uh, cooperative development in Canada within three emerging trajectories. We don't call them categories; we call them trajectories because they are in motion and evolving, and they come from a long history as well. Um, uh, first is what we call community economic development cooperatives. And these are focused on community revitalization, community needs uh, of some sort. Uh, they have strong connections to other community organizations and or social movements by their founders. Okay, the second category uh, is the conversion of business businesses into worker cooperatives and community cooperatives, and also the conversion of community assets into cooperatives. And the Unleashing Local Capital Initiative is one strong example uh, of that, but also um, in the community aspect, but also in particular uh, when you uh, convert a, a business into a, a formerly private business into a cooperative, as CareForce uh, will, um, will also uh, show. Now, the thing is that cooperatives, for example, in our, in our sample, of the, of the people we have on, on the panel today uh, is an example that they cross-cut these categories as well. These, these categories aren't clean, right? It's not that cooperatives fall into one or the other. Um, but these are, uh, they, they tend to fall within these when we talk about cooperative development. And lastly, uh, what, what we call Canada's social enterprise cooperatives. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Peggy Bailey couldn't be here today, but uh, that was one example that we were going to use um, for this type of cooperative. And here, the cooperative is uh, in, in really a social enterprise using the cooperative model. Uh, that it uses some market activity, but with a strong social mission aimed at delivering a particular good and service to a community. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Marcelo. So now we're going to move to um, have our panelists uh, talk about their experiences in um, starting up co-ops and, um, and being a part of co-ops in, in their communities. So um, first question out to the panel. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it starts right at the beginning. How, why did you start your co-op and what were some of the uh, key objectives? Dan, do you want to maybe make a couple comments on that? Sure. In our little community of Sangudo, it's a small rural community, 380 people, and I really believe the reason we got started in it was because of a crisis. Uh, there was a threat that our high school was going to be closed, and that got people really excited and, quite frankly, ticked off about what was going on in our community. However, we moved reasonably quickly into looking more at the, the broader economic situation in our community and realized that uh, we were in a really tough spot where you know, half of our business buildings on Main Street were sitting vacant. And so we were really at a point where we were afraid of losing our community and we wanted to do something to revitalize it, to get some new businesses in, to be able to keep the existing businesses there and to have them strengthen themselves as well. So I think it was really based upon a perception of a crisis. I mean, it wasn't a flood or it, nobody was dying, but it was a perception that we were losing something that was really important to us, which is part of that social need. 
And so what were some of the key objectives? The objectives really were to get businesses into some of the vacant business buildings, to uh, get some more people coming to our community, living in our community, uh, which eventually would mean more kids possibly to fill our school as well. Which, And if we've got a vibrant school, it helps the entire community as well. So I think the key objectives were really for us to work together as a group of leaders to keep our community alive. What were some of the main challenges that you encountered in starting up? We were a first of our kind for this type of a co-op in Canada. There were some other examples, similar examples out in Nova Scotia with their community economic development investment funds. However, ours was very different and based upon the legislation we've got in Alberta. So it was new and so we were up against you know, trying to figure out how to incorporate and what to incorporate and uh, huge, huge legal fees that were involved and uh, not really knowing what we were doing. So somehow being first into anything is a little bit scary and uh, unknown, and so we were up against using a lot of professionals, which cost us a lot of money as well. However, we did have a little bit of a ace in the hole because we had been chosen to um, accept an award through the Alberta Community and Cooperative Association, which gave us some financial support to work through feasibility studies and the legal requirements for starting our co-op. But and beyond the technical pieces, the legal pieces, uh, some of our other real challenges were we had all kinds of great ideas to start businesses using our co-op model, but we as a leadership group didn't want to run it. So we were looking for entrepreneurs who would run the business and treat it as their own. We didn't want to be hiring managers and staff. Instead, we wanted to be the incubators where we were supporting entrepreneurs to get into their own business. So I think that was probably those two were the biggest challenges. One, the finding the entrepreneurs uh, that we knew and liked and trusted, and the other one being the legal and uh, technical pieces. Thanks, Dan. So as a result of our experience in Sangudo, uh, the Alberta Community and Cooperative Association uh, were able to apply for some funding through the Rural Alberta Development Fund, which was set up to help all kinds of um, economic development things in, in Alberta. So they were able to get some funding to uh, have a two-year project to develop what's called Unleashing Local Capital Program. The program was to use uh, what had happened in Sangudo, as well as some of the best information we could get out of uh, Nova Scotia, as well as some other new generation co-op ideas uh, in Alberta, to develop a whole program and a system that would make it really easy for other communities, and in this case, uh, they were aimed at rural communities in Alberta, to create opportunity development co-ops, somewhat like what we've done here in Sangudo. So over the two years that that program was being developed, there was a comprehensive guide that was created both online and in a print form as well with a bunch of uh, videos and a ton of resources. And uh, also we worked with the lawyers uh, to develop a, a template for all of the technical pieces, the articles of incorporation, the, the bylaws, the subscription for shares, and any of those types of agreements so that it would make it much easier and very cost effective for any community to create their own opportunity development co-op. So that uh, while we were going through that process of developing the, all of that program, uh, we opened up uh, some pilot communities and three communities were chosen initially to kind of work through and learn from them to add to the, to the guide getting some feedback in there as somebody else joined in now. I'll continue on then. So anyway, the, uh, we opened up to three pilot communities. Uh, two of the, one of the communities, uh, the uh, or Smoky River Opportunity Development Co-op up in the Flair region in the northern Alberta, they were going to do a 55 plus housing unit. Uh, they've gone through some major challenges up there. Uh, they are incorporated, however, I don't believe that they've actually started on a building at this point. They've kind of scaled back to a much smaller project. Uh, Beggarville was uh, chosen. They were going to be doing 
kind of a similar project to what we had done, which was uh, the succession of a meat plant and an abattoir. And there were some; they had some challenges there in dealing with the the group in the co-op and the entrepreneur who was currently running the meat shop. And and so they eventually withdrew from the program. However, we learned a lot in that experience as well about the delicate piece of succession planning and that transition mm -hmm. from older owners to younger entrepreneurs. The Crow's Nest uh, group down in south southwestern Alberta, they incorporated and uh, uh, right away bought uh, an old historic building on Main Street of uh, Blairmore, which is right in the Crow's Nest Pass. They went through a huge project of renovating that old building and they ended up with four residential apartments in the upper floor of it and two commercial uh, spots in the lower part of the building where they have them all rented out now and they're doing very very well uh, it's providing a great return on investment to the, the to the co-op and also back which means back to the to the members uh, those three projects gave us great information as we continued on with developing the whole program the, the guide and the resources and uh, we opened it up to three more communities to test it again and to refine it even more uh, six communities, three of those have incorporated their opportunity development co-ops. Hmm. They've got great leadership. The challenge they're having in all three cases is finding the right business and finding the right entrepreneur to actually run those businesses. The other three communities, there were some leadership challenges and uh, not finding the right opportunity and so they haven't incorporated. However, we, we have a strong belief that at least one of those will incorporate and will move ahead. So at, by the end of the program, there were three new opportunity development, no, pardon me, five new opportunity development co-ops. And um, we, there currently are three more communities in Alberta that are moving forward, either have incorporated or are in the process, and a number of other communities that are very, very interested in moving forward. And as long as the leadership group is solid and strong and they follow the, the guide and the program and... They also get access to a coach that will help them through the whole process. Uh, the, the program seems to be working. We've got lots to learn, but it's, it seems to be working now. And Dan, one of the, one of the cornerstones of uh, the Unleashing Local Capital uh, model of um, community opportunity development cooperatives is actually using local capital for developing these cooperatives. And in particular, using, uh, for example, registered retirement savings plans uh, is that correct? Maybe that you can speak is, a little bit about that. That is absolutely correct, and I believe yeah. that's the real strength in this: is that it's in the community, for the community, and by the community, and using local money. So this is mm -hmm. local money that people have in the community have earned in the community, and so they're investing it right back into their own community, where they can be active and engaged in their own investment. The the real beautiful piece about what's happened through the Unleashing Local Capital, as you mentioned, is the ability to access registered retirement savings plans, either new money that is being contributed into RRSPs, or even more powerful is the money that local people in your community already have invested in companies in Toronto or New York or somewhere else. But this is a way where they can redirect that money right back into businesses in their own community. It still stays within the RRSP. However, it's, uh, the money is redirected right back into the community. Mm -hmm. but we know that this is huge in Alberta and all across the country because right now in Alberta there's over $4.5 billion a year that is invested into RRSPs. A large chunk of that leaves our communities and leaves our province. So it's a huge yeah. amount of capital that we can tap into in our communities. Yeah, and this is something that that that's been used for for some time in Nova Scotia as well, which is part of the inspiration for for the Alberta model. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if we want uh, if Seth is on, if he wants to comment and add to um, add to uh, Dan's uh, wonderful ex, ex, uh, expo, expose <laughs> explanation of the initiative. But I know Seth was really involved in uh, in the Unleashing Local Capital initiative, and then we can uh, return to Joel. And, and see what's going on in, with CareForce. But, so Seth, do you have any uh, additional comments uh, to make? 
Sure. And it, yeah. uh, again, I apologize for the, the confusion with the audio. And uh, it's, it's always difficult to follow Dan. He does such a great job at, at telling the story and, and really explaining the, these core themes. I think, um, you know, maybe just a, a couple of things that always kind of come to mind is, is you know, when we're looking at these, uh, the, key, the key objectives are some of these broad things and, and definitely what uh, Alberta Community and Cooperative Association um, you know, we're, we're really interested in, in how do you build a, a strong local economy and, and co-ops have always played a, a strong role in that. And I think that when you're, you're, you're building these skills and you're changing attitudes around how you can use your money and how you can use your social capital, how you can use your, your knowledge um, in terms of uh, business development or, you know, how do you hold really effective meetings? How do you, how do you rally your community and bring them together? Those skills are all really important to, to, uh, bringing capital home and, and, and building kind of the, the putting together the building blocks that are essential for a strong local co economy. And once you're able to, um, pool capital, um, it, it creates this, the, you know, the kind of the ballast, um, to, to do lots of other things. Um, so I think that, you know, definitely looking at the, the success in, uh, in Nova Scotia with the CEDIF program and, and looking at Sangudo, I mean, they've done three, three projects. I'm sure there's, there's more that's, that's going to be coming out that you, you're seeing this cascading effect where, where people are starting to invest differently. Um, and the, it's being, uh, copied by others. So I think that's, um, looking at uh, as well, looking at the success of, of uh, great grassroots examples that are then able to be transferred to, to other areas. And uh, so, so really seeing it that way, but it definitely, um, it's, uh, it, it, it catches on. And I think that that's where we'll see these really big kind of changes in, um, in, in uh, community economic development and also people being able to kind of have this really profound understanding of, of what co-ops do. Once you've, put your money into them. Once you've been involved, um, you definitely see uh, what can happen. And uh, we're really excited about what's happening here in, in Alberta. Great. Joel, maybe maybe you can uh, talk a bit about uh, how uh, how CareForce was started and, yeah. uh, and what sure. were your key objectives and, and a bit about the business conversion model. Uh, so CareForce, as I was saying, started as a co-op or actually transitioned into a co-op in 2008. Uh, it was a private enterprise for about 17 or 18 years prior to that. And like I said, the major goal was employment uh, preservation. We had a group of people who, a group of home care workers who stood to potentially lose their job and source of income if uh, the, the current owner of the business either sold the business or just closed the business. So. Employment security uh, was certainly a, a, a major priority for us. Uh, all, obviously, there were other factors. I mean, the, the opportunity to have more control about how the, the business was run, uh, philosophically, uh, from the care standards point of view, and so on. But I think it would be safe to say that the major the major goal was keeping jobs at the time. And what were um, what were the so those were the key objectives. Um, what were some of the challenges in, in, in starting CareForce? There were two major challenges. Uh, the major challenge, one major challenge was financial. Uh, the other one was knowledge. Um, buying out a business uh, of the size and scope that we, we were at the time uh, was significant. Um, but we had to take out a, a pretty considerable loan to be able to do it. And the ability to get that loan, it took a little while. Um, a lot of the members who, a lot of the would-be members who, who wanted to buy the business didn't have the financial resources among themselves, so they had to, to seek alternate financing. The second obvious uh, hurdle was knowledge. And, huh. and there was just a total lack of, well, maybe not a total lack, but a, a significant lack of knowledge about the co-op process. The worker co-op language was kind of a foreign language. Um, everything from bylaws to incorporation and, and everything in between. So there were two major hurdles, and, and thankfully, with a little bit of help, we, we overcame them. That's fantastic. And how is CareForce doing now? Uh, it's doing great. Uh, we started, I think, with about seven members at the time, and we have 26 member owners today. And so it's been a it's been a steady growth. The company has grown fast. Um, 
I know one of the, the other questions here, I, I don't know if we're getting to this, but I was just saying about the lack of knowledge and the biggest, you know, probably the number one thing that, that helped us was Peter Huff. Peter is with the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation and Peter is a co-op developer and I, I think it would be safe to say that without his guidance and knowledge that we probably wouldn't have ever moved into a worker co-op. I just don't think the the knowledge was there to be able to do it without him. Um, so I guess that's a, a bit of a plug for him. Yeah, uh, we'll get into the role of cooperative developers uh, at the end. That are sure. they're, they're they're showing to be very important uh, in Canada for co -op, for developing co-ops. Uh, I know we need to s leave some time for questions from uh, from those that have joined us today. Um, Fiona, are you there? I am, and I was just going to suggest that um, we move to uh, conclude so that we have ch at that time. Yeah. Do you want me to make some, some concluding uh, comments? Please do. Okay, so uh, the last slide, uh, just to sum up um, some of the conclusions from our research uh, and from the, um, from the stories and experiences that we've heard, um, co-ops are indeed in Canada being used for meeting social, environmental, and community needs. Uh, there's no mystery there to those that are involved in co-op development <laughs> and uh, starting co-ops. Um, but in this, despite the lack of clear and broad legislation across the country, in particular, it has to do with how cooperatives and cooperative legislation has been developed in Canada, which has been a provincial, uh, provincial initiatives, and, and some provinces have stronger supporting legislation than, than other provinces. Um, an interesting place to compare Canada to is Italy, that has strong national uh, cooperative uh, legislation. Uh, that supports the development of co-ops throughout, throughout the, the country there. So it's an interesting comparison, and yet Canada still has a rich cooperative uh, tradition. Um, so in supporting co collective entrepreneurship for new co-op development in Canada, challenges exist. There's challenges in funding, uh, in, in maintaining the motivation of volunteers, and in a few volunteering, uh, a few people in the co-op doing most of the volunteering tends to be one of the challenges. Um, and and the challenge is also in rallying people around consensus and uh, participative decision making, which is the strength of co-ops, but also makes it a challenge to run them sometimes. Um, and co-op developers, as um, Joel suggested, are are really strong uh, across the country uh, from everybody we spoke to, uh, pretty much uh, in that knowledge building. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Um, and we'll open it up to questions. Great. Thanks, Marcella. And thanks, uh, um, Dan and Joel and Seth, and for bearing with us as we work through our technical issues. So um, now we'll ha we have a almost 15 minutes um, for uh, opening it up to uh, Q&A with our, our audience. Um, we would suggest that you either um, type it in to the chat of uh, um, function and Brendan can then see that and read that or you can also we will try this but I think you can also raise your hand and then we can unmute you and you can ask the question directly <laughs> in theory <laughs> so maybe we'll start there's a question um, that somebody typed into the chat so we'll start there and um, Joel and, and uh, Dan and Seth uh, feel free to hop in so Bonnie Hudspeth has, uh, has typed in a question, and it, it is and asking if there are any tips on finding and training the right skill sets for these various startup co-op groups. Uh, a number of startup food co-ops we're working with in the Northeast U.S. are having trouble finding good project managers, uh, and et cetera, and it, would, it slows down or stops their progress. So co-op developers, once again. Uh, Joel, did you want to make any comments on that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure that I know the answer. Um, in terms of training for this particular type of skill set to, to start and grow a co-op, I think the only real thing that I'm aware of here in Nova Scotia is St. Mary's has a, an MBA program in cooperative management. Uh, I'm not sure it's I mean, it's not specifically designed, I don't think, for co-op development, but I presume that a lot of the skills would be transferable. I mean, I think you would 
you would naturally develop the skill set to, to do what you needed to do through that. But overall, I, I'm not sure that I know about a great deal of, of training available. Uh, Dan, do you have any ideas? Well, uh, for food co-ops, um, the one that, that most recently I guess I've seen is the toolbox for education and uh, social action in, uh, I think they're in Massachusetts. And they've, uh, I think they, they're starting to offer some webinars and, and to focus around, um, you know, specific types of, of co-ops. Um, co-ops own and their, their program I think would be, you know, that's another uh, excellent resource. Um, I guess looking at as well from the, you know, APEX organizations and, and uh, provincial uh, co-op associations is looking at some work that, that focuses in on a, on a certain topic. Um, you know whether that's food or work or utilities, and I guess the other piece too, it, and you know doing and and this has probably come through with your research as well is looking at how you know cooperative prim principle six right co-ops helping co-ops, and I think that there, there there's lots of examples of you know you're getting on the phone or you're you're calling up um, you know a new a new co cooperative or a cooperative that's doing something that you're interested in. Um, and, and ask them how they do it. it it's, uh, I, I think that that's something that makes cooperatives unique uh, compared to other types of structures is, is, is being able to kind of share that information. And it's definitely people that have, you know, a, a really unique founding story, but they've definitely seen um, the same challenges it's, it's, uh, and, and the same opportunities. So they, they, you know, they'd definitely be willing to share. And I think that that's something that you know, maybe uh, we need to pr promote more a as cooperators to say, like, you know, how do we how do we talk shop? How do we talk about cooperatives? Um, and and how do we get them started? So that that might be like the the the, the first step is to is to find a co-op that's doing the thing that you want to do and get them on the phone. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, we have somebody with their hand up. I, I have Amitava Sanyal, who I've just unmuted. Uh, if you have a question, Amitava, please proceed. It seems that Amitava has, might have uh, mute on their computer. Uh, Amitava, if you can hear me, you need to unmute your computer so that we can hear you. Okay. Hello? Yes, Hello. hi. Uh, hi. Can I ask a question now? Can you can you can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Hi. Thanks. Uh, my basic fundamental question is that how are we different? How our corporate is different from an investor-owned model? Uh, because the founders are they form the cooperative later on become technically, not uh, as an investor model, because there is no membership induction when the cooperative moves forward. That was basically the question. Then how are we different from that? Great. Thanks. That's a great question. Dan, did you want to start us off? Uh, if I, I just want to make sure I understand the question. Is the question, how is a co-op different from an investor-owned model? Is that kind of what we're getting at? Yes, differentiating. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's different. I mean, I think there's a, a, you know, a lot of this is going to sound a little bit soft, but I think it's philosophically we're different. I mean, at Care Force, and I can only speak for us, is that we tend to have, in my view, a much larger personal investment from people who work here because they share all the same benefits. Uh, that any owner would would share, um, you know, how does that play itself out? I think it plays itself out through better customer service for people. Um, I think it, you know, it's a great story. People are always trying to find out what how we're different, and, and they're amused and amazed, I think, by the fact that that the people who serve them in their homes own the company, and that's just a bit of a novel idea for them. So, you know, again, I know that's not really you know, that's not a hard fact. Uh, it's more of an opinion, but that would be my input. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Marcelo, did you want to jump in on that? 
Yeah, I think the the, the question was, and I'm going to put it back to the panel to the to the actual cooperators. Uh, the the question also extended to how do the founders not become, in essence, the owners? That that how is the is the um, uh, is the purpose of the cooperative to be a collective uh, endeavor maintained over time? I think that was one of I think that was implicit in the question just asked. So I'm wondering if uh, maybe one of the other. Uh, uh, Seth, did you want to handle that? Uh, sure. Yeah. This is uh, and I think looking at at the opportunity development co-ops and and unleashing local capital. Um, that uh, the founding members play such a, a huge role in, in getting the ball rolling and much like a lot of cooperatives. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do and, and definitely identify this as, as a challenge in maybe cooperative development in general is how, how do you, you, you get, you build this momentum, pr prepare the founders to, to, to form the co-op, but also how do you create succession within the organization? So how are you getting, um, you know, uh, more people into uh, leadership roles, um, that they're understanding the governance structure and that they're moving uh, up, up through the organization, as well as being able to bring in different voices, different experiences, and also people who will be in for the long haul so that there's a, a generational kind of uh, planning uh, that goes there. And that really, I think, comes down to having, having a clear understanding of this at the outset, as well as being able to budget and plan for uh, training and education and making that a part of, of, of what it means to be part of, a, of the cooperative that as a, as a member that you're able to you know run for the board and as well uh, receive the training and, and be able to, to develop those skills so I think it needs to be something that's kind of um, uh, w you know grafted uh, into the into the core of the organization and really seeing that as a, as a member owner uh, that you also have have a say, and how do you build that uh, that piece into it? So it, it's really kind of the the founding group needs to you know they're, they're, there's a lot riding on them, and, and they they commit a lot, but they also have to be part of kind of the 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 succession and and long term uh, planning as well. I would if I could just add on to that very quickly. Uh, at CareForce, we have a we have a mandatory 12 hour in house develop. Uh, co-op orientation program and regardless of whether you come to work here and intend to be a co-op member or not, uh, you, you are required to take that training and it, it covers everything from governance to to the day-to-day -day operation of the business, the bylaws and, and pretty much everything in between and, and absolutely you have to keep that up otherwise you're, you're absolutely right. There is, there is a, a lack of, a, an over time lack of enthusiasm. Sure. I'm going to bring uh, Lynn Marco on for our last question for today. Uh, so I uh, just want to confirm that we've unmuted you, Lynn. Could you let us know what's working? You might have to unmute yourself. I think I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Oh, great. Uh, Lynn, you can be tight on your question so we have time. Okay, I will be tight. Uh, this is an important part, um, piece of research. It's been going on for quite a while. It was got funding from um, a wide variety of sources, including the Canadian Co-op Association through our CDI funding. Um, one of the things I saw that you, at near the end, you kind of skipped the issue of future support for co-op development. And what I want to know um, is, in the report, is there a, a, a large enough section that talks about the need for support and resources to help fund, uh, to help new co-ops get started? Uh, we need more funding, and this report is a really important that it confirm how important it is that there be outside its expertise to come in and work with groups, that it is an important part of it. And I'm wondering if there's anything in there that even mentions the Co-op Development Initiative and what it did for 10 years. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that quickly, as quickly as I can. Absolutely. It's, it's the research is based on um, the, the sample we drew from is, is, is a, uh, the Cooperative Development Initiative. Uh, and the uh, it, it stems from 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 that initiative, but it it um, it it asked. Uh, we looked at specifically um, how 
we looked at supports and we asked the cooperatives that we interviewed about supports and the number one uh, I think the number one uh, finding around that is uh, educational uh, is uh, across the board from where do we tap into these multiple sources of funding uh, how do we secure funding because the funding is often hard to get and it takes a long time to prepare for uh, and how do we guarantee long-term uh, resources for developing our cooperators, for developing our business. Um, so knowledge and education was was a big one. And so one of the things that that we proposed was to, um, and this is still this is just, this is just a uh, kind of a blue skying in the future that uh, the next CDI, if there is one, could be one. Could be one that's focused on, or, or some kind of initiative focused on uh, a concentrated uh, development and knowledge building uh, educational component. Um, and so we do mention that in the report uh, in our sets of recommendations. Uh, Fiona, do you want to add to that? Are you talking about co-op developers being paid to be able to help groups? Uh, to be able to do the planning, the, the feasibility studies, the leadership development, all of that sort of thing? Or are you talking about some kind of broader general uh, knowledge and education? Well, that already exists. Uh, we, Canada has a rich tradition of cooperative developers. Um, what the, there, there's a gap with some cooperatives in that um, they're not able to access some of those developers uh, and and where they are, and, and most most were, but where uh, but sustaining that type of support, right? So 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 the idea would be for the actual the, the cooperative members themselves to be able to sustain it long term, and so that would require some more a broader initiative, uh, it seems to us, right? So but but tap, yeah. I'm sorry. Is there another question? No, I was just going to jump in. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. So the webinar is for one hour, and we are now at our hour mark. Um, clearly, this is a topic that has many, many angles and many, many um, other uh, trajectories to, to, to look at. Um, but for the, for the time being, I think that we'll have to uh, stop, stop this conversation right now, but we hope that this will, will have spurred on conversations with um, your co-op or with your organization, and uh, there's only room to grow here around new co-op development. So we've come to the, uh, to the end of our hour together. I would like to thank everyone who attended. And I would like to also apologize for the technical challenges that we that we had in this webinar. Hopefully, I will be able to assemble and remove the parts of that uh, challenge and and put this online for us to to view and to share with uh, with other people who are going through the co-op development process. So thank you to our presenters and. Um, and don't forget, there will be uh, an additional uh, additional webinars in this series. Uh, one more in this year, and three more coming up in 2015.